Okay, should I get started, Amir? Mm -hmm. All right, good, good day, everyone. Thank you again for joining us at SDMS. Um, um, most of you here are you know, regular attendees, so you know the format. We have long form and short form talks. We have talks in the long form by a PI and then a short form talk by a grad student and postdoc. So we are running out of our list of stu grad students and postdoc now. So I really encourage you guys to nominate your graduate students or nominate yourselves if you think you have a good story to share. This is a fun platform as you've already seen. Nobody is trying to you know, beat down the other person. So come share your science. You get a good discussion going and get new ideas. So feel free to send us nominations and share your ideas with us. All right, so we have two very incredible talks uh, lined up for you today. Our first speaker is Professor Lewis McDowell. Um, he's a professor of chemical physics at Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Um, Lewis obtained his PhD in chemistry in 2000 um, under Carlos Vega, who we have heard here before, and I think everybody in the field knows. Um, as a PhD student, he worked on the equation of state for alkanes and development of Monte Carlo codes that was employed later for simulations of ice and water. He's also visited Jean Paul Reichert's group at Brussels and Kurt Binder's group at Mainz. And so subsequently he uh, joined Marcus Mueller and Kurt Binder to do a postdoc in the Johannes Gutenberg University at Ma Mainz, Germany. Um, then he obtained a Ramon Y. Kajal Fellowship. I probably butchered the name and Lewis can correct me on that in 2002, where he then started his new research um, in statistical mechanics of interfaces. During that time, he also obtained his first national habilitation in chemical physics and then took a permanent position in currently where he is in 2007. And since then he's been working on interfacial phenomena um, from different systems, including ice. And we are very excited to have you here, Lewis. Our second speaker today is um, Yulia Pimunova from University of Utah. And she's currently working with uh, Michael Grunwald, who we heard um, just a few weeks ago. And um, she's doing her PhD there with Michael. And before re receiving her PhD, or sorry, before starting her PhD, um, Yulia received her BS from Southern Federal University in Rostov on Don, Russia, where she focused on investigated, investigating non-platinum electrocatalysts for low temperature fuel cells. And in her current research, she's working on co-crystallization design principles, and we'll hear about that more today, I suppose. And then in addition to research, Yulia is also very actively involved in outreach activities, including organizing research conferences at the department level, as well as volunteering at sports events. So we are very excited to have you as well, Yulia. With that, I will stop and I will pass on the screen to Louis. So let me, there we go. Okay, so thank you very much uh, Sabna and thank you very much Amir and Sabna for organizing this very nice uh, seminar series. I think it's, it's a very good idea and, and talks are really very, very interesting. So my talk today is about uh, the structure of the ice surface and how this structure impacts the way ice grows in the atmosphere. So, if we think of, of when we talk about ice crystals in the atmosphere, actually we, we mean this very nice snowflakes and we're all familiar with this kind of dendrite structures that are typically in Christmas postcards, but they're really uh, infinitely complex, but uh, uh, typically we, we find just these kind of, of dendrite shapes in, 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 in drawings, but in fact, uh, ice crystals in the atmosphere come in very many different shapes, much more, many more than, than the dendrite sort of shapes. And this is, uh, this is summarized in, in a very nice diagram, which is called the Nakaja diagram. Okay, the Nakaja diagram describes the shape of ice crystals as a function of water vapor content and temperature. So you can see that dendrites are actually formed in a narrow range of temperatures at large humidity. But usually ice crystals 
grow initially at least at low saturation, at low saturation. And when they grow at low saturation within this region of the Nakaja diagram, and as you can see, they grow in rather simple uh, prism, hexagonal prism shapes. And as you might have noticed from, from the stripes in this diagram, there is a very peculiar sequence of changes in the shape of the ice crystals. Technically, the changes of ice crystals are known as, as habits. So here, have, as you might have noticed from the bottom top of the Nakaya diagram, we first at close to zero degrees have hexagonal prints with the shape of a plate. But if we cool down, they are transformed into columns. And then further cooling, the columns are transformed back to plates and then from plates back to columns again. And so that's a very intriguing sequence of transitions of crystal habits, which is, is I thought, a very challenging and interesting problem to study. And it is, it's, it has, it's really poorly understood the reason why these uh, transitions could occur. The fact is, uh, when we make a close-up of, of an ice crystal, which can be very complex, as you can see here, if we make a close-up and look at the surface, what we see is that the eye surface is also rather complex. So this, this uh, snapshot from a simulation is showing eyes, which is here in dark blue. And on the surface of eyes, you don't get a sharp termination of, of the ice uh, lattice, but instead there are a few molecular layers which melt. Eh? And these are shown here in turquoise turquoise green. Eh? These atoms here are melted water molecules, the melted water molecules. And so we say that the ice surface exhibits pre-melting, that is a quasi-liquid layer, hmm? a layer of ice molecules that has been sort of melted. And so it's a layer with properties similar to water. And one conjecture is that this complexity perhaps is the reason of this uh, sequence of transitions that uh, I have shown in the Nakaja diagram. So the outline of this talk is first uh, uh, trying to ask two main questions. First, can we characterize the ice surface or particularly can we characterize this uh, uh, complex uh, surface structure of ice? And this means, first of all, can we define an equilibrium film thickness, a well-defined equilibrium pre-melting film thickness, huh? the thickness of the quasi-liquid layer, then what the structure of this quasi-liquid layer is and whether we can measure the properties of such layer by studying surface fluctuations, okay? Notice that surface fluctuations or fluctuations are a very usual way to measure and um, probe properties of systems in a non-invasive way, because you just let the system evolve, measure the fluctuations, and fluctuations typically always have some input on uh, important uh, parameters, thermodynamic parameters of the system, okay? And that, Per se, it's an interesting goal. Can you see my pointer, by the way? Okay, that's an interesting goal. But then we will try to answer whether that information on the equilibrium surface structure can allow us to understand how does ice grow within the atmosphere. Hmm? So whether we can predict the out of equilibrium behavior of ice from the equilibrium structure of its surface. Okay, so the first question we need to answer in order to characterize the equilibrium structure of the ice surface is whether what is the thickness of this quasi-liquid layer, okay? And of course, if you have a question there, you, you might be tempted to do some experiments, but unfortunately, it seems that experiments are providing conflicting results, okay? So this figure here, borrowed from, from a recent paper, is showing just a very, very small sample of how much experimental measures are scattered. Some like this green measurement from ellipsometry or this red measurement from X-ray diffraction appear to be suggesting that as you approach the melting point, the quasi-liquid layer thickness is diverging. But in fact, computer simulations, which have difficulties attaining zero, appear to have much smaller film thicknesses and other experimental techniques also appear to be suggesting that the film thickness is limited. Hmm? So that's a problem that it's an answer, and you can look in several recent reviews on the subject, which are perhaps inconclusive on this issue. Hmm? The way uh, 
people with uh, experience in, in surface physics and wetting theory approach the problem of adsorption is, that is, what is the thickness of the quasi-liquid layer, is by studying the interface potential. Okay, what is an interface potential? An interface potential is a measure of the free energy of the layer as a function of film thickness. Hmm? And interface potentials come in two flavors. Either you have an interface potential with a local minimum, that is an absolute value, uh, an absolute minimum of the free energy at finite film thickness. In that situation, then you'd be like in this situation here. When you approach the melting point, the film thickness remains finite, just because the free energy is minimal at the finite value of the film thickness. The alternative is that you have a minimum, but at infinity, very far away. And in that case, you'd have this situation like the green line. So the film thickness is diverging. Okay, so that's are the two possible outcomes of an interface potential. And the question then is, well, why care about interface potentials? Because we can do the measurements experimentally. And the good thing about interface potentials it, is that there is a large body of uh, theoretical uh, knowledge that allows us to constrain very much how the interface potentials should look like. Mm -hmm. So first of all, let's try to see how we could measure the interface potential for such a tricky system as ice, uh, as ice, as the ice surface. Because in fact, uh, when we measure interface potentials, usually we like to change the vapor pressure. And that's why, and that's the way it's done in experiments. But here we have a single component system. So we cannot just simply change the pressure and measure the film thickness because then we'd be out of equilibrium and then we cannot have a meaningful film thickness. So what we must do is to study only the system along the sublimation line. This is the line where solid and vapor phases are in equilibrium. And only there you have a meaningful uh, pre-melting film thickness of finite thickness. Hmm? And the problem then is that the total surface free energy is equal to the interface potential, which measures the free energy when you are along the liquid vapor coexistence line because the interface potential assumes equal chemi chemical potential of vapor and liquid. But in fact, we are here. So we, we must account for the free energy cost of pulling the liquid film from this point where it is at coexistence with vapor to this point where it is not, okay? And so once we have written this free energy, measuring the interface potential is easy. Hmm? We cannot really measure the interface potential, but at least we can measure its derivative. Uh, we, re we request that this free energy should be at equilibrium. And so its derivative must be equal to zero. And then immediately we arrive at this relation. Uh, the derivative of the interface potential must be equal to changes in pressure, where this is just a Laplace pressure difference. It's just the pressure difference between the bulk liquid and the bulk vapor at the coexistence chemical potential, uh, at the coexistence chemical potential of ice with vapor, okay? And that, uh, this function here is called pi, the disjoining pressure. So the way you measure interface potentials is make a simulation of your equilibrium film thickness, find what the film thickness is, and to each of those values, you can associate the Laplace pressure difference. And that gives you the, the, the derivative of the interface potential, okay? So we have performed those calculations for tip 4 PIs. And here I'm showing the film thickness as a function of temperature for the basal and the prism surfaces. So once we have those interfaces potentials, we make a simple equilibrium thermodynamic calculation to get the Laplace pressure difference. And then that allows us to map film thickness to disjoining pressure. Here you see the disjoining pressure as a function of film thickness. The disjoining pressure as a function of film thickness is the der derivative of the interface potential. And as you can see, we are getting positive disjoining pressures which appear to decay monotonously. So if you recall an interface potential or its derivative decaying monotonously, that is suggestive of having complete uh, wetting of, of the pre-melting layer hmm? because we never have a minimum according to those figures. Hmm? The problem here in the simulations is twofold. First is that it is very difficult to measure film thicknesses beyond about one nanometer because you'd need very large system sizes to measure uh, larger thicknesses. And the second is that it's very difficult to approach very precisely the melting point. 
because the system is finite and the thermostat has some uncertainties. And so you cannot really approach the melting point under a very controlled manner. So, and the third problem is that typically you are truncating long range forces. You are truncating the Leonard Jones tail of your potential, which has a contribution and it's actually very important as we will see. So this information is not sufficient. We need additional information. Hmm? And the additional information comes from theory, okay? According to theory, the interface potential is the sum of two main contributions. One is the short range part of the interface potential, which accounts for packing effects and correlations. And the other is the long range part of the interface potential, which stems from the van der Waals interactions, okay? And the theory says that this short range part, that's the way it's called short range, decays fast. As you can see, it decays exponentially and could have some oscillations, okay? So when we take this into account, for our measurements of the short range part of our interface potential, we're going back to our results that you've already seen, we make the fit and we get a very nice fit to the model of short range intermolecular forces. But as I said, this is not sufficient because then you, we must account for the Van der Waals contribution to the interface potential. And the Van der Waals contribution to the interface potential has this decay. It decays algebraically which means it decays much, much slower than it does the short range part, okay? And the crucial issue here is, what is this constant? This is the Hamaker constant. Huh? And the value of this Hamaker constant is going to decide exactly what is the fate of the pre-melting layer thickness. Huh? We will see why. And there are very sophisticated theories to determine the Hamaker constant, but in fact, there exists a, a nice result from thermodynamic density functional theory, which is quite accurate, in which you can estimate this Hamaker constant from this equation, okay? Epsilon and sigma are the Leonard Jones parameters of your model. And then we just need to account for these density differences. So the density difference between vapor and liquid, vapor and water, that's negative. And exceptionally for ice, the density difference between the solid and the liquid also is negative. So this is a singular behavior of ice because of its anomalies. And therefore, what happens is that the Hamaker constant for, for this problem is positive. So if it's positive, it means that the van der Waals potential is negative. And this means that it is an attractive potential, an attractive potential to the film thickness. So it means that long range forces are attracting the film thickness towards the ice surface. And as a result, huh, the final outcome of the interface potential exhibits this clear minimum here, okay? This clear minimum. It's the result of wetting from the short range contribution and non-wetting from the long range contribution. And so that's the theoretical conclusion from, from wetting physics, okay? From wetting physics, it's clear that there should be no surface melting on pure ice. Things could change if you put impurities, but for pure ice, there should be no surface melting, which means that the quasi liquid layer remains of finite thickness up to the melting point, okay? Now, this uh, uh, theoretical uh, expectation actually is confirmed uh, with uh, from very nice experiments performed by Sasaki and collaborators, where they, they look at, at the ice surface with using confocal microscopy, and they can clearly find that eventually at sufficient saturation, water droplets form on top of the ice surface. So what that means is that say partially ice is hydrophobic. Yeah? It doesn't like to wet completely and has water droplets on it. So it's consistent with, with the theory. But these experiments have brought a very uh, complex uh, question also, uh, which is paradoxical because if you look at, at this, uh, picture here where they, they, they are measuring the ice surface at very low supersaturation, they can clearly see steps. And these steps are of molecular size. Yeah, so that's really like steps growing on top of ice. And the conjecture, and actually you can see this very, very nice, nice picture where you see the steps propagating below the droplet, okay? And so uh, this uh, author said, well, steps are a feature of very ordered surfaces. They are typical of high temperature, high energy metals. So if we are seeing steps, then we cannot possibly have a pre-melting layer at equilibrium. 
And then they claim then that the layers that are observed are actually not layers, but droplets. Hmm? And that looks reasonable from these pictures, but how can we reconcile that observation with our simulations where we clearly observe pre-melting, okay? And so to understand this, we also had to um, go back a little bit to theory. Mm -hmm. And in theory, there are two types of canonical interfaces. You have uh, the typical fluid vapor interface, which is rough. Mm -hmm. It has undulations due to entropy. Mm -hmm. And then you have the canonical high energy solid surface, which is flat, mostly flat. And because, and the entropy here is not allowed to make undulations, but it's just allowed to make molecular size steps. And these surfaces here are smooth, are called smooth, and these ones are called rough. And in fact, solids uh, at sufficiently high temperature many times exhibit a roughening transition in which you trans go from this smooth surface into this rough surface, but still being a solid. And this has very important consequences in the growth rates, because for the growth rates, if you are smooth, you are going to grow by 2D nucleation, two-dimensional nucleation. It's an activated, slow activated process. But if you are rough, you are going to grow by a mechanism that is linear in the saturation. Okay, so it's a very important difference. So let's go, let's look back to our interface. Our interface, what is this? Is this smooth or rough? Is the, should this behave like a fluid fluid interface or should it behave like a solid fluid interface? Because if you think of this pre-melting film, actually it's formed of two different surfaces. You have a surface that is separating the solid from the liquid and then another top that is separating the liquid from the vapor. So th this brings a, a, a complex question because we're not in the canonical situations that folks have usually uh, used to, to distinguish different surfaces. So here we had to sort of uh, write down a, 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 a new theory for the problem. And what we write down is an equation for the free energy. It's, this is an attempt to measure what is the free energy cost of fluctuations in our system, okay? So we have our interface, here's the solid, and it has a solid liquid surface and here's the vapor. So it has a liquid vapor surface. And we would like to know what's the cost of having fluctuations at these surfaces. So first we need to account for fluctuations of the solid surface away from plan planarity. That cost can be measured by the ice water surface tension. And this gradient here is just measuring the amount of increase of the surface when it becomes wavy. Mm -hmm. But then, this solid surface we know it pertains to a solid, so it's not going to be willing to move just anyhow. So we put this potential here, and this potential is a sinusoidal potential. It's called the sine golden potential, which is requesting my film thickness to follow as close as possible the lattice, the underlying lattice. Okay, so this is going to be favorable only when film thickness grow by the period of the lattice. Okay. So this accounts for solid uh, liquid fluctuations. And then we have the liquid vapor fluctuations. They have a term that weights the cost of uh, increasing the surface area and is weighted by the surface tension of, of water, the surface tension, ordinary surface tension. But then we've seen that the pre-melting layer thickness likes to have an equilibrium value, not just any arbitrary value. So we must add here the interface potential. And the interface potential is a function of the film thickness, and that is of the difference between the heights of both surfaces. And in this way, we are coupling this Hamiltonian of the solid with this Hamiltonian of the liquid. Mm -hmm. And in principle, it looks complex, but with some uh, mathematical tools, uh, Gaussian renormalization theory, it, it can be solved exactly for the spectrum of surface fluctuations, okay? These here are the Fourier transforms of the surface heights along the parallel direction for the uh, ice water surface, for the water vapor surface, and for the capital fluctuations. Of course, these equations look uh, terrible, uh, but in order to understand them, it is convenient to define this, is called the wave vector dependent surface tension, okay? This has units of surface tension. It's a wave vector dependent surface tension. And it's known that in the limit that Q equals zero, it becomes exactly the surface tension, the ordinary surface tension that we know, 
okay? And it's obtained from the surface fluctuations as its inverse. It's the inverse of the surface fluctuations times Q squared. Hmm? And the equations look difficult, as I say, but the behavior changes completely depending, depending on one single parameter. This is the smoothness parameter, okay? It's the smoothness parameter that is proportional to this free energy here of creating steps. And when you take that into account, you find that there are only two possible outcomes actually in qualitative sense. Either the smoothness parameter is different from zero, and then you have an effective surface tension that diverges in the limit of zero wave vector. What does this mean that the surface tension diverges? It means that it costs an infinitely large amount of free energy to have long wavelength deformations of your surface. So your surface really wants to be, remain flat. So that's a case of a smooth surface, like faceted surfaces in high energy solids. There is a roughening transition in which suddenly the smoothness parameter becomes zero. And when the smoothness parameter becomes zero, everything changes. The wave vector dependent surface tension, now all of them converge to a finite value. And this finite value is sigma, which is just the sum of the two involved surface tensions, ice water plus liquid vapor surface tensions. So in this limit, this compound surface behaves just as one single surface with an effective surface tension. That is the sum of both, okay? So this is showing you that if even under the assumption that we have pre-melting, it is possible to have a smooth surface. And when you have smooth surfaces, you observe with microscopes, what you observe is steps. So it means that the observation of steps by the experimentalists is not inconsistent with the presence of pre-melting, okay? So we have checked this for the T4PIs model, and we have measured the effective wave vector dependent surface tensions. And for all temperatures that we studied, as you can see, we can see this divergence, this divergence of effective surface tension. And the symbols, which are simulation results, are rather nicely fit by our model. So in conclusion, at least for PIs, we can say that the basal surface and also the prism surface are both smooth and therefore they are faceted, but yet they exhibit pre-melting, okay? So the second main conclusion of my talk is that the ice surface is smooth, but also exhibits pre-melting. And I think this explains in part the Sasaki experiments then that I've showed. But a nice uh, uh, feature of, of this surface fluctuation study is that you can also measure the distribution of surface heights surface heights in our system, okay? This column here is showing the distribution of surface heights as a function of temperature. And so at very low temperature, what we find is that the surface heights are unimodal. They behave like a Gaussian. But if you rise the temperature sufficiently, suddenly they become bimodal. Can you see this? They become bimodal. So what this means is that in a range of temperatures, the ice surface is faceted, but it will like to have two preferred step heights. It will not be flat, but it will prefer to have two, two preferential step heights. And then eventually, if you further increase the temperature, it becomes unimodal again. So what this is showing is that it seems that there is a surface phase, that there are surface phase transitions here. I'm going from this phase, which is unimodal, to this phase, intermediate temperature, which is bimodal, and then back to uni, a unimodal surface phase. And you can see here, that this bimodality uh, can be clearly observed in the surface maps of heights. Eh? Green is low height, red is mm, high height, <laughs> sorry. And you can see the steps there, okay? So it, it's a region of proliferation of steps. So it, it's very tempting to correlate those uh, transitions perhaps with these ones that we observe here. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I'm running out of time, before we do that, we need to check whether the equilibrium, the equilibrium structure of ice is actually significant. Because if you look at the experiments here, we are out of equilibrium and many things could be occurring that make a, a equilibrium structure of the surface not relevant for, to explain this behavior. So the way we explain, the, we try to answer this is going back to our model of free energy. We've seen this already. 
And then we add surface bulk terms, which are allowing us to move away from the uh, coexistence line. And this is the free energy. And there's a very general theory that says that the time evolution, the time evolution of uh, thermodynamic fields hmm, is given by gradients of the free energy. Hmm? So to put it simple, for example, this is accounting for the time evolution of the solid height. And it's saying that, well, it will grow by freezing, melting. And, and that growth is dictated by the gradient of the free energy with respect to that height. I don't have time to, to go into the details, but the issue is this looks very complex, but it can become simpler in the situation in which I assume that both surfaces are rough. If both surfaces are rough, I can get to a situation of this sort where I say, okay, my solid surface height is going to change with time. So ice is going to be freezing, that is growing, yet in a situation in which the pre-melting layer thickness remains constant. Is this possible? And the answer from our kinetic model is yes, that's possible. If this condition is obeyed, you can get this kind of quasi-stationary growth where ice is growing because you're out of equilibrium, but the layer thickness is remaining constant just as it was in the equilibrium behavior. And the condition allows us to map the disjoining pressure which, have measured, we, which we have measured already from equilibrium simulations with a kinetic Laplace pressure difference, eh? which is given by pressure differences and the rate constants of the kinetic process. Mm? So then what happens? What happens is that we get a dynamic phase diagram that has allowed us to draw this red line and this blue line. Mm? All points which are below the red line have an effective interface potential like this one. It has an absolute minimum, which means that you are super saturated. So ice is going to grow, but yet the pre-melting layer thickness is going to remain constant. Hmm? So we show here that in this film, we have put a small step in the ice surface, and this is the liquid vapor surface. Hmm? And we will see that, you see this step, is being able to nucleate a similar step on the liquid vapor surface. That's the one that is observed experimentally. With a microscope, you can only observe this. You don't observe this. But actually what you're observing here is a feature of the solid surface. And then when it has been nucleated, it spreads horizontally. If you recall, that was exactly what we observed in the experiments by Sasaki. Terraces were spreading horizontally. So what we are seeing once more is that indeed you can have a pre-melting layer, all of this, and yet observe horizontal translation of states, which is epitaxial growth by 2D nucleation. Next, what happens if we cross this red line? If we cross the red line, then the minimum now has become metastable. So you can make excursions at large film thickness and decrease the free energy. So to explore that, we have created here a defect on the ice surface. The liquid vapor surface is completely flat. And let's see what happens when the system evolves. OK, you see that a droplet is formed. Huh? Above this line, a droplet is formed. And droplets are formed only above the red line, which is the dynamical liquid vapor coexistence line. Huh? Because in, in wetting, in ordinary wetting for inert substrates, whenever you are above the liquid vapor line, you get droplets. Huh? Here, out of equilibrium, you need to go well beyond that liquid vapor line to get droplets. Huh? So it's, uh, that's a unique feature of out of equilibrium behavior. Huh? And finally, if we cross the blue line, huh? we start our simulations here. Then I start with the same small defect as I, I started in the first uh, movie. And you will see that the initial behavior is similar. But notice now that the interface potential has become unstable. There are no longer minima. So first, initial behavior is the same. And eventually, sorry for that, it becomes messy. Huh? Why? Because it becomes unstable. Huh? So here we are at this spinodal point. The surface is an able point, and you get just whatever. Huh? Then the film thickness has diverged here completely. Huh? So beyond this line, equilibrium structure is completely meaningless to describe the system. Huh? 
but below the red line it is. Okay, so conclusion three, equilibrium surface structure does remain significant, at least at low saturation. But low saturation is actually the atmospheric situation in most cases, okay? So now it means that this picture I showed before is, which was obtained from equilibrium simulations is meaningful. Hmm? And so our fits to the surface fluctuations are also meaningful. And if we perform those fits, then we get a value of the smoothness parameter. And you cannot be perhaps surprised that the smoothness parameter is related to the step free energy. What is the step free energy? Is the free energy cost of nucleating steps on your smooth surface. Okay, so when we undergo the roughening transition, the smoothness parameter becomes zero and the step free energy vanishes. But as we have seen, in our simulations, always W is finite, and so we will have finite step-free energies. And so we have calculated the step-free energies, which are shown in this figure here. So step-free energy as a function of temperature. Red lines are results for the prism phase, and blue lines are results for the basal phase. And as you can see, close to zero temperature, the step-free energy of the prism phase is small. If it's small, it means that it is the prism phase that grows fast. So if the prism phase goes fast, you will get plates. But then if you keep cooling, it's the basal phase which has smaller step-free energies. And then the basal phase is going to grow fast. But if we further cool, the prism phases become, have smaller step-free energies. Right? And so you get growth of plates. Right? And that is, if you recall, exactly what was observed in the Nakaja diagram. Hmm? Plates to columns to plates. Right? So all simulations are providing the first two phase transitions observed in the Nakaja diagram. Okay, And that's why Nakaja wrote this nice haiku, which says snowflakes are letters from the sky. Hmm? Because if you look at the shape of the snowflakes, in the ground, you can tell the temperature and water content where they grew above, right? well above. Okay, and with that, uh, uh, as a final conclusion, conclusion four, we have shown that equilibrium surface structure and pre-melting behavior explains crystal habits, crossovers in the Nakaja diagram. Okay, and this is just a summary of the conclusions we've saw before. I'm out of time, so thank you very much for your attention. Let me just uh, acknowledge the work of my co-authors. The project started with a PhD student, Bennett. He followed with John Bart. Then I had a good student, Luengo, who was undergraduate and also made very interesting contributions. And uh, finally, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Luis, for the fascinating and wonderful talk. So, uh, let's give uh, Luis a round of applause and uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. So if there are any questions, you can raise your hand and, you know, unmute and ask. Yeah, I, I got, yeah, maybe I can start and then uh, until like others are uh, actually thinking about questions. I got a bit confused because it looks like based on your, uh, the film thicknesses that you got from your simulations, you concluded that the surface of ice is smooth, but then when you, uh, you are creating these models later for how these different basically parts of the layer are growing or shrinking. You assume that it's not rough in the sense that W is not zero. Like I got the, I lost the connection between the two. How, how did you go from smooth to rough? So no, the issue is, let me go here, that in surface physics, this was uh, developed in the eighties, we have two canonical type of surfaces, the rough ones and the smooth ones, okay? But that description, my claim is that is not really uh, sufficient for describing ice because here you only have one surface. That is the interface has just one surface. In, in ice, 
if we want to describe the pre-melting film, you have two surfaces. So the question is, uh, because uh, rough surfaces are typical of the liquid vapor interfaces. Liquid vapor interfaces are always rough. But here we have a solid liquid interface, which could be smooth. And so when I apply the theory to this more complex problem with the same Hamiltonians that you study the problem, behaviors. Right? You could have both behaviors in the presence of mm -hmm. pre-melting. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we are observing in simulations is this behavior, which corresponds to finite smoothing parameter, smoothness parameter, and therefore it implies that the eye surface is smooth. So the implications are several. It means that the eye surface is smooth, it means that the growth is activated. And so it grows by two denucleation. Yeah, this does not mean that we cannot have uh, defects on the surface. Perhaps you, this is confusing you. This is a smooth surface with a defect. If the defect would grow from just wherever, then it would be rough, but it only grows by nucleation, by spreading of the defect. Huh? When we go make the film, I see. the only way you can get ice growth is layer by layer. It's by spreading of this initial nucleus. Hmm? Okay, I see. This happens if you are sufficiently close to saturation, that is at low saturation. Of course, eventually, when you cross this spinodal line and the system becomes white, you are no longer you are no longer smooth. This is called kinetic roughening. When the system becomes very saturated, then it's no longer representative of the equilibrium situation, and you get kinetic roughening. And that's why here you get uh, initially an activated scenario, but very soon the instabilities, you see that's rough, that's, that, that becomes rough, but it's kinetic roughening. At equilibrium and at low saturation, it's smooth. Mm -hmm. I think I see Baron. Uh, yeah, um, I, uh, I, a fascinating talk, Luis, I liked it again. Um, I, um, I, I wanna ask if, if it's, uh, if there's any reason to rule out growth uh, consistent with, with what you showed us by spiral mechanisms where you have still a mostly smooth surface uh, with a uniform pre-melted layer over the top um, and, and, and those, uh, those edges spreading in spirals. So that's, that's a very good question, Baron. So uh, whenever you have a smooth surface, you can grow either by two denucleation or by spiral growth. So spiral growth is consistent with uh, smooth surfaces. I mean, you wouldn't get spiral growth in rough surfaces. Mm -hmm. You only get it in smooth surfaces. So by the same, uh, with the same model that I have used for describing this uh, 2D spreading by nucleation, I am persuaded that one could describe also spiral growth, and that would be a very nice project, but then we would need to extend this model numerically to two dimensions. Okay. Okay, so David Sibley, who, who, who performed these numerical calculations, he, he was excited about doing that, but I, I think he has been very busy and, and never has got to do it. But uh, let me tell you that for one single surface, so one single smooth surface, which would be described by a single sine Gordon model, then spiral growth can be can be observed in the model. So I expect that we'd see here also spiral growth, but with a pre-melting layer. Okay. And indeed, in the experiments, they observe the spiral growth. Thank you. We have Ravi. Yeah, very nice talk. So, I mean, I have a question regarding the surface transition mechanism. So it starts from unimodal to bimodal and bimodal to unimodal coming back again, right? So mm -hmm. is it specific to the ice planes or like a bezel or prismatic or is it a kind of universal for any phase? This one here is, these are results are specific to the basal phase. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have similar results for the prism phase, but for the prism phase, they occur at different temperatures and they are less 
obvious. The bimodality is less obvious. Say that this this minimum here is higher, so it's not as, mm -hmm. as obvious. So it's not. It's definitely not universal. It, it's a rather unexpected uh, behavior to have mm, this transition, and as far and it, it's a kind of transition that was uh, speculated to occur by physicists in the 90s, but in very little cited papers. So it, it's a rather uncommon situation. And the most intriguing fact, if, if you think about it, is how when you increase the temperature, which is like uh, meaning to promote entropy, you go from bimodal to unimodal. Right? That's unexpected. So that's like being sort of close to rough here because we have two preferred heights and then moving back to smooth. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this happens, I believe, is that because here you are trading uh, surface disorder uh, for, from heights of the surfaces into surface disorder of the melting, the pre-melting film. You know, that's my speculation, that you trade okay. The entropy of the liquid molecules that have grown in the pre-melting film here for the entropy that you had for the different types. No, I mean my, I mean my question was like, yeah, I mean I understood uh, your point. So usually in the literature, like basal phase grows like uh, layer by layer, right? So that might be consistent, but when it comes to the prismatic plane, like because it's a rough surface, I mean having two different kinds of uh, plateaus, I mean that. Uh, I was confused about. So that's a good observation. Look, uh, perhaps you are familiar with the ice liquid interface, which is not yes. exactly as the ice vapor interface. Okay, so if you look at the Nakaya diagram, if you look at the Nakaya diagram, where is it? Here. Can you see sharp edges here? Yeah. If you see sharp edges, this, this, this is the prism phase. Mm -hmm. If you see sharp edges, it means it's smooth. So uh, uh, ice crystals are, have a prism phase which is smooth up to minus two degrees. At minus two degrees, they become round. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that was illustrated here, I think in the, where was it? Uh, was it, where was I telling the difference between smooth and rough? Here, okay. So if you are in the uh, below the smoothening transition, you get sharp corners. If you are in rough, you get rounded corners. For the prism phase of ice in vapor, you get this transition at minus two. If you are, have ice in water, the transition occurs at minus fourteen, minus mm. four. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I guess we don't have any other questions. So let's uh, 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 thank and applaud uh, Luis again, and we can move on to the second talk by Yulia. So Yulia, the floor is yours. So go ahead, Julia. Thank you very much, everybody. Let me. Thanks a lot, Luis. It was wonderful. Yeah, thanks for 